друзі, ми розпочинаємо наш захід і презентацію дослідження євроінтеграції агросектору. Dear friends, we are starting our event, what to do to improve our negotiation positions. My name is Jana Hrivinka, I'm the senior economist of the Center of Economic Strategy, and today I will be the moderator. The translation into English you can turn on at the Zoom panel. The questions to speakers, please leave in the Q&A. This research was done with the support of uh, Yednania in the framework of the support of the intersectoral support of civil society, which is uh, done together with the Consortium of Political Research and the Center for Democracy and Rule of Law, thanks to the generous support of the American people through USAID. If we talk about our today's event in general, the amount of power and the competitiveness of the Ukrainian sector can significantly improve the level of uh, competition in the EU, so we believe this topic can become one of the key stones with the negotiations with the EU. And in order to speed up this process, to make it as successful and as pain-free as possible, we need to develop the integration plan of the Ukrainian agro-industrial uh, complex to the internal European market. And during this event, we will present our vision and we will discuss what can be done in order to strengthen the positions, the negotiation positions of Ukraine. I would like to pass the floor to the <coughs> author of this research, to Olga uh, Trofimtseva, who is uh, ambassador at large, Doctor of Agricultural Sciences, Olga, ex uh, ambassador at large. Many thanks, Ms. Yana. First of all, thanks to all the colleagues who are joining us, both as speakers and as participants of our today's event. In reality, I wanted to mention that, first of all, it's not the first time that we have this event, because starting from the beginning of this year, the Center of Economic Strategy already was doing the research with uh, various uh, angles, various uh, points of view of our Euro European integration process, looking at the dynamics of uh, trade, looking at uh, the questions how successfully we're integrating from the point of view of the adaptation of our legislation to the requirements of the European Union or to the internal regulations of the European Union. And today, basically, we will continue this subject and I would like to say that we will also look at, uh, as I often say, such an expression uh, like an umbrella. We will try to look at the whole complex of issues that pertain to the integration of the Ukrainian agro industrial complex to the European internal market in the closest in the closest years. So in order not to delay time, I will start with the presentation and then we will come to our discussion. I believe you can see my screen. Great. If today, if we talk where we are at the moment, from the point of view of all these integrational processes, also we will try to see where exactly our possibilities are. So really, a more, a more giving more attention to look at the niches, uh, to look at the, those uh, fields, areas of opportunity, which European integration gives to us, and which Ukrainian agro sector, as Ms. Yana says, gives us the possible that gives to the European Union or the agrarian sector of the European Union. And we will also talk about the next steps and those proposals and conclusions that I have reached in the framework of, of my research. First of all, let's uh, look at this overall our progress that pertains to the adaptation of the legislation to the European processes 
to the European internal legal practices and procedures, requirements. And in case we look at the figures, uh, they basically look, as you see, not so bad, especially in accordance to results of the last self-screening that we did, the analysis for 23. We see that uh, also the breakdown by various uh, branches of power. Actually, the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine has done the best job of the specialized ministries, including Agrarian Policy Ministry, but also this uh, progress is very much different depending on the sphere, depending on uh, this or other uh, European integration field. Also, it's very interesting to look here also at the figure of progress for 2023 in 2022 because uh, we understand perfectly that in the conditions of the full-scale invasion already in the conditions of this full-scale war with russia also this work didn't stop and irrespective of anything in reality thanks to the strengthening of this european integrational signals in 2022 this european integrational process not only didn't stop but also in some areas also were coming even more actively also uh, some of you must have seen this map that's a great visualization from the ukrainian club of the agrarian business that uh, have given us and presented at one of the latest um, agrarian conferences if i'm not mistaken just uh, a few weeks ago the so-called export portfolio I think it's uh, for the sixth or for the seventh time we're preparing that and gives the possibility to see how in years there is the change of geography, geography of our agrarian trade, especially of the exports of the Ukrainian products and why this map why this map is also quite interesting for us because what we are seeing now over the last uh, year 2023 where we have the official statistics and in case we have with us uh, Taras Kachka who is uh, must have uh, joined us maybe he will also say a few words additionally exactly about the development of the agrarian trade with the EU now we can actually see without any exaggeration that European countries have become the biggest um, exports market for agrarian products and this was also connected with the fact as I said in the first place we should talk about uh, these uh, single-sided references that were presented to Ukraine back in 2022, which gave the possibility <coughs> to the Ukrainian agricultural exporters to save themselves uh, to a great degree, when basically we had almost at stall the sea exports of Ukraine, so from Ukraine. And also from the other side, uh, I would not also downplay the successes of adaptation and in terms of this uh, additional regulatory questions, because these are two parallel processes and basically any progress that was uh, in the European integrational efforts uh, over the last these few years uh, it gives the possibility to the Ukrainian companies uh, uh, a little bit quicker to reg get registered uh, uh, as capacity that it has the possibility to export our products to the European Union. You can see here that if in 2021 some up to 60% of the Ukrainian exports have gone there. I wanted to go back because uh, over various, uh, various spheres, if we take the agriculture and the development of rural territories, 
we see that by today, some 77%, we have implemented our commitments in terms of adapting agriculture in this area. I also here need to mention that the situation here is not uh, actually uniform in which sense. If we're talking about exactly about agriculture, what it means, uh, for instance, about the agricultural practices, about the production, regulation of some uh, production practices and the like. That's where we have quite a big progress already reached, starting from the implementation of the agreement about association of EU and Ukraine in terms of rural territories. It's a little bit different situation. Nevertheless, thanks to decentralization and thanks to adopting the strategy for the development of rural territories in Ukraine and some other documents. Also, since recently, we have received quite a good progress, although, although our European partners in their report for 2023, they say that during the last uh, half, uh, several years, if we talk about the development of rural territories and organizing internal markets, that's where the progress is somewhat slowed down and these spheres, these areas deserve special attention. I'm also very much proud once again, not over the last year, I'm very much proud of uh, to which extent Ukraine has been able to move ahead in implementing and in adapting Ukrainian European norms and adaptation of the Ukrainian legislation in the area of uh, one of the most demanding areas in the sphere of uh, European integration. Is it's uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures and veterinary veterinary medicine. <clears throat> and whenever we're talking about this sphere, also we can see that uh, the percentage has gone above 80% in accordance to our self-screening that was done by the Ukrainian side over the last year and in the previous period it actually uh, reaches the level of uh, above 80 percent why I'm paying special attention to this is because you and I especially if I'm not mistaken in one of the previous uh, researchers in, and in one of the previous presentations and such online events by the Center of Economic Strategy, we recollected about the area of phytosanitary separately, especially at the background of those protests and let's call it uh, claims, certain claims in brackets that were filed by some of our neighboring countries in terms of the quality of the Ukrainian products or about uh, the procedures, organizing internal procedures, supporting the quality, the safety of these products, of uh, plants, uh, animals, uh, crops that are exported to the European Union. And that's why it has this huge uh, meaning, because that system really Let's put it this way, it has gone through a big way of reform starting from 2016 from the moment of creating the state service, state consumer protection service and uh, the service related to the safety of food products and protection of uh, consumers' rights. And correspondingly, the system has continued to develop I would say to develop and also to adapt at the same time, albeit all difficulties and albeit all institu institutional turbulences that took place starting from 2019 until recently. And I would also want to emphasize on the importance of this uh, sphere, of this field of work for us, because <laughs> We have, uh, let's put it this way, there are certain areas in the European integrational commitments which possibly directly would not affect 
for instance, let's go back to this uh, beautiful picture, map, they would not uh, influence to which extent whether whether our agrarian expert is working or not working. But when we talk about the phytosanitary measures, veterinary uh, measures and organizing internal control, both at the national level as well as at the level of each company, and at the level of uh, each uh, individual associations, some voluntary unions of production capacity specialists. And so the participants of today's discussion will also confirm that execution or non-execution of all of these matters absolutely directly affects uh, the fact whether we can export something but also even not only the EU, but also other markets. Correspondingly, this is one of the key elements of working of our system in general. I would put it this way. If we're talking about agriculture, then we have some technical barriers in trade or movement of goods, trans-border, cross-border, and we are seeing that we have actually some good progress uh, re received in terms of the adaptation of our legislation to the European. But once again, please pay attention to the number of those acts that still require further implementation or the ones that are still subject to be implemented. Therefore, we are seeing that the number of such regulatory acts is quite big. So in front of us is still a lot of works in the spheres which we, I have outnumbered, outlined. Thanks to the work here, we also have this free movement of goods through border, as from the point of view of our experts to the EU, and vice versa, which is also very important. This didn't stop even during the full-scale invasion by Russia. Now let's talk a little bit more about uh, those objectives, assignments, and that's where we have absolutely the area for discussion. That's where I wanted to hear some additional thoughts of our discussion. Participants, I'm sure they will add something to this. Which are the objectives for next year's? And these uh, conclusions or these uh, steps which are outlined here, that's not everything, but exactly these are the things that the attention was already given in the previous researches published by the Center of Economic Strategies, and you basically can find them all on the website of the Center to look up what we're talking about, because it's in very much detail. Of course, because of the deficit of time, we will not pay additional attention within our presentation, but really, when I already recollected, when we talk about the agricultural production or the area of agriculture, the European Commission pays special attention that for Ukraine remains quite a big challenge. The issue related to the regulation of internal market of Ukraine, meaning agrarian market, agricultural market, in accordance with the European rules and regulations. We mean the questions which are related to competition, including this, something that was emphasized in the last report of the European Commission for this issue, that's equal access, providing equal access to the market and equal opportunities and competition for some small and medium-sized producers. So that's where the question is, uh, <clears throat> it still remains quite a lot of work with this. Also, we are seeing that, by the way, just last week I saw the news, and you also saw this, that they adopted already a law on state agrarian register. Very active work is ongoing to make sure that state agrarian agricultural register as part of the system of financial support, again, correspondingly was uh, in compliance with the rules of the European Union. It should be implemented SAP in Ukraine, at least step by step. This is already happening, that's in progress. And that's a great thank you to the Specialist Ministry, Ministry of Agri Agrarian Policy, and thanks to the, a lot of 
donor projects that are supporting these projects from the European Union, who help us with the implementation of state agrarian register, not only to them, but everybody who is engaged in this work. But once again, these rules that pertain to the development of rules, that pertain to the financial support of the producers' national plans developed as part of the common agrarian policy of the European Union. All of this, that's a wider field, wider area, and it's not only about the support of uh, agricultural producers, it's not only about the financial support of farmers, that's also an issue of financing, really a comprehensive approach to financing programs that will be included, including issues such as uh, the sustainability of production, the social component and uh, also the development of rural areas and the, and the like. Also in the third item, it is uh, about um, direct payments to farmers and whatever is connected to this. That was in the State Agricultural Register. It's good that the first step is already made in this direction, but once again, that's far not it, and it's far not the full system, the way how it's working, how it is implemented in the European Union, or its uh, national elements that are implemented in each of the European Union countries. And very important is, and I'm sure you have heard numerously about that, such a challenge, for especially for our producers of agricultural products. That's what we call animal health and welfare. And that's where I believe we have to count, or let's put it this way, if we plan realistically, this could be one of the spheres where we have to talk about the possible about the possibility of some longer transitional period for our producers, about the possibility of engaging some additional investment into this sphere, into this area, because uh, studying the experience of countries of the European Union who were accessing since recently, meaning Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, it says that uh, to a great extent, we can also say that the work is still ongoing in these uh, areas, and you can't say that uh, fully that they're aligned, especially if we talk about the requirements related to about the implementation of these requirements in terms of animal health and welfare. I mean, let's if we're talking about France and Germany, or if we're talking in comparison about Romania or Bulgaria. So that's, again, a not very easy and quite demanding work, the sphere that would require additional attention and the focus by the Ukrainian side in the following years. Also, genetically modified products, GMO, GMP, uh, also you know, and I'm sure you know in, in the European Union, and Mr. Pugachev will say a few additional words about that issue, because the regulation of the genetically modified products the question of uh, GMP in the European Union, that's a big, separate, uh, huge, uneasy, controversial subject, and correspondingly to it, we would need to approach with full responsibility, and we have also done quite a few steps in this direction. We have seen a lot who are present here today, remember, uh, how long and how painful and not easy it has been for us uh, to discuss the draft law on regulation of uh, turnover of GMP on the territory of Ukraine and uh, its products. But once again, I just wanted to emphasize that uh, one law, it's not... Uh, the whole regulation, and that's where we would need to look at in which way one or the other spheres in this particular field are organized. 
how this is organized. I apologize, I was looking up in the chat. I, maybe I thought there are some technical or some other remarks, just not to miss that. And once again, by the way, quite uneasy and controversial subject that still is in the European Union and is very much actively discussed in Ukraine among agricultural producers, among all the stakeholders of our agriculture. That's the topic of usage of pesticides, fertilizers, plant protection aids, and again, the compliance of the Ukrainian legislation and practices, the practices of using uh, various uh, protection aids or pesticides uh, by the Ukrainian producers in accordance with the European regulations and European legislation. This slide I would also like everybody, in case you have any additional uh, challenges or problems that you see from your side, do share with us. But once again, personally, for myself, I have outlined this list, such systemic challenges that hold us back, and they hold us back not only during the full-scale Russian invasion, it's not over the last uh, three years, two and a half years, but uh, they really have been holding us back <coughs> before in our European integrational roadway. First of all, it's tough shortage in key areas of European integration. And I believe that uh, unlikely somebody will say no to this, because when you talk to the representatives either of the central or the regional authorities, that one way or the other are responsible for the adaptation or for the integration of the uh, Ukrainian agriculture to the European Union, the ones who are developing various initiatives, uh, bylaws, uh, everybody will tell you that uh, people are in deficit. And we are really seeing this almost every day from those announcement when they are searching for experts in all areas to make sure that this work is dealt with. So it's a problem that uh, we definitely need to work on in a more systematic, systemic way, engaging those experts that are now <laughs> in the European Union, because we have a lot of experts, our young scientists and experts that were forced uh, to leave Ukraine or moved from Ukraine even before the full-scale invasion, and they're working in various areas, which I believe we could uh, be more actively engaging to these European integrational processes. Insufficient institutional capacity of key responsible institutions. In my opinion, we can trace that absolutely. Also through factor number one, the staff shortage, we are seeing that the Ministry of Agrarian Policy is suffering, also suffering are other bodies of central authorities, even the Consumer Protection Service that I already mentioned about, because this is one of the key bodies in this direction, or even the state geocadastre, correspondingly insufficient institutional capacity in reality that's in the first place about people and about staff and in the second place it's also about this third factor that is mentioned here it's about lack of internal financial resources the development of course uh, this insufficient financial resources now very often that's again as a consequence of the budget of the country that is at war when the major share of our financial efforts is aimed at uh, defense and uh, providing the armed forces of Ukraine and we understand that the major part of taxes that are arriving into the budget they are meant exactly for these defense objectives nevertheless once again it all brings to the point that our key institutions in a certain way they we can feel that 
they could do more, in my opinion, but once again, because there is the absence both people and finances, it's important to very clearly do the prioritization namely really, really strict prioritization really there is no possibility to really scatter our attention to various work streams unfortunately because yeah maybe we could work and move much faster in many european integration directions that i already mentioned in some of the areas we need to create some new institutions and one of the examples is uh, the same payment agency that has to be separated separately from the Minister of Agrarian Policy. It shall not depend on the Minister of Agrarian Policy. Again, as part of this ecosystem, financial system, the system of direct payments for farmers, and that also, that is the area where the work is still, is at the beginning. And we definitely need the understanding how we will be in generally financing the system in accordance with the regulation of the common agreement policy, how shall we organize that, how we will be how shall we work with this particular area? And of course, it's also important to do the high quality professional translation of EU legal acts. And also for some areas, I've also met uh, some conclusions of the experts where we need to make the terminological harmonization of some of them in the sphere of uh, Senate to phytosanitary uh, or veterinary, it would be really good to really to be on the same page. Separately, I wanted to attract your attention to the point, uh, to that uh, conclusion that we came within our research, namely the search of those uh, areas of opportunities for our European integration in the sphere of agriculture. That is really the view on agriculture as uh, how it is done in the European Union, namely when we, when the agricultural sector is part is not considered uh, as agriculture per se or only agricultural production but rather as part of the circular economic green uh, economy and uh, we have quite a lot to offer some unique niches and opportunities they are outlined here it will be interesting to hear your opinion but we're talking about green energy and renewable energy I'm sure that is very much interesting for us and for the European Union. We're talking about the bio-based building materials, uh, the carbon production, which actually started to develop in Ukraine, and about uh, supply of vegetable proteins or the raw materials for the pharma industry. So these are the areas where, in my opinion, they are very much promising, also from the point of view of the interest to them by the European business, European industries, not only the agricultural sphere, not only agricultural companies, and correspondingly, these are those niches where they would be happy to see us and where it's possible to work a little bit more to make sure we can understand what exactly we can offer and where we are not competitors, but rather a good uh, added value, not a raw material component, but really a good integral component of the European agricultural market. In terms of the conclusions, very briefly, because to me they sound really evident, from the one hand we see that we have had the significant progress in harmonizing our national legislation with the EU norms in many sectors, <clears throat> including phytosanitary to some technical barriers in trade. In case uh, Thanks also to what I have already mentioned, thanks to this uh, autonomous uh, uh, trade preferences from the European Union, we are seeing that this integration is taking place and adaptation is taking place not only on a formal level, not only on a regulatory level, 
but quite successfully implemented at a very practical level at the level of each company, ex each exporter who are getting more and more irrespective of the full-scale invasion, they are entering the European markets. Also, from my side, I'm seeing in our official and unofficial communication with the colleagues in the European Union a much better understanding, also thanks to our research. So it's a better understanding of the geopolitical benefits of Ukraine's accession in the agri-food sector the accession of Ukraine into the European agricultural market, because that really complies with the strategic interests of the European Union, which are announced in the in all last strategic uh, regulatory documents of the European Union in this area. That's the strategic autonomy, it's the independence on imports from third countries, it's also the leadership on world markets. It's really that Ukraine can really improve in the European Union. In terms of the recommendations, if I'm not mistaken, this is, I think, my last slide, but, but one. But once again, it's very important. And I believe that looking at a big number of topics and a lot of levels of the European integration in this area of uh, agriculture, basically from the central level of the bodies of central authorities and ending with some separate chromadas in various uh, oblasts of Ukraine, we have to create this multi-level matrix of European integration, which shall take into account all related sectors and all the subsectors. So we uh, have to have this overview, bird's eye view, this general view over this matrix in order to understand the interrelatedness of all of these elements about a clear prioritization of the next steps, giving the limited financial and human resources. Therefore, we really need to look at it also from the very pragmatical point of view, what needs to be done in the first place as next steps in the adaptation of the legislation and not only, but also the development of uh, various strategic documents and the like. Also very important in my opinion, and this is a lot uh, is uh, looked at and attention paid by our experts and European experts, especially about the inclusive approach of, for the development of certain regulatory acts and policy making. All stakeholders at the table should be at the table, representing agriculture, all interested associations, all interested uh, organizations of producers and the like. Those areas of opportunities, we should have a very proactive stance on our fields of opportunity in terms of practical integration of the agricultural sector into the European internal market and a very systematic and sustainable communication with partners in the EU at all levels, not from time to time, not only at the level of the government, but really try to keep at all times, at all levels, the sustainable communication in order to comply with this multi-level matrix where we see what everybody is doing in each of the cells of this matrix. In terms of next steps, we paid attention to this research, working with the strategy of the European Union, some strategic documents of the European Union, and having looked at the main sectoral strategies of Ukraine, which are still in the making or are already implemented, we still need to change certain approaches and the basis for making strategies and the approaches for the development of strategies in such a way like it is done in the European Union to make sure once again it is compliant with the best uh, relevant EU practices that there would be no contribution because nowadays we see that uh, some sectoral strategies there they don't really fit to each other they don't match each other and that should not be the case because each of these strategies has to be aligned comply with the overall comply with the overall economic strategy and again to be developed with the best European practices. We should continue to work on expanding the possibility of Ukraine's participation in existing European Union programs to obtain funding for European integration activities in both the public and private sectors 
in many of such projects we are here already, but these opportunities are many more. That's why I wanted that the Ukrainian associations and possibly separate from others, territorial communities and bodies of power, uh, scientific institutions, research institutions will participate in all possible research projects in the European Union that give the possibility to get some additional financing for various European integrational initiatives. Also to strengthen the focus on climate-adapted agriculture. This is also one of the great recommendations from the European side, based on the results of one of their reports. Correspondingly, coordination of our environmental protection agricultural strategy, harmonizing all of our ecological strategies and strategies for the development of recovery, renewable sources of power and the, the like. So that all should work as one. And further development on the rural territories and increased coordination with regional policy in general, as well as better coordination of structural instruments with uh, financial and budgetary capacities. Further development of the decentralization process, and that has to be coordinated, and the structural elements have to align from the point of view of the financial and budgetary capacities irrespective of their limitation. That's where I would like to stop. Many thanks to you for the attention. And now I think we can go to the discussion. Many thanks, Olga. Many thanks about uh, recollecting the research that we have done before. Yes, we did the screening of the European and European legislation, comparing the structure of European and uh, Ukrainian agriculture. Do please familiarize yourself. It is all available on our website. So let us come to our discussion. We have uh, the Alberto Fernandez Diaz, uh, the, the chief of the uh, trade uh, uh, of the European Union. Mr. Diaz, the first question to you, in case you have certain reflections or comments to the presentation, we would be very happy. And secondly, please tell me, in case uh, you can uh, separate one fundamental thing that needs to be done in order to speed up the integration of the European agriculture to the internal European market. So what would that be in your opinion? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon to, to everyone. I'm thanks for the presentation all on the on the prospects for the integration of uh, Ukraine's agricultural sector into the EU. Um, you mentioned several times autonomous trade measures that were implemented by the European Union in uh, 2022. Uh, let me just first, uh, I think I can confirm the language in use. Uh, can you can work very well? Actually, your sound is really poor. Okay, let me let me see if I can change. Can you hear me better now? Yes, that's better. Okay, and I have to confirm my language. I, I just think about the interpretation and. Um, yeah, that's okay. Go ahead. I translate into Ukrainian. That's okay. Okay, into perfect. The Ukrainian channel, you. But now you, I'm you not, sound I'm really not that great. familiar with Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so. You mentioned several times autonomous trade measures that were implemented by the European Union in 2022. Um, that was a bold step taken by the by the EU. But let me bring a bit of perspective about how things were, how things are, uh, and how things can be when it comes to integration of Ukraine's uh, economy into the EU. Well, first of all, the overall objective of what we have what we have since 2016, the association agreement notably the DCFTA, is to integrate Ukraine gradually into the internal market. That was the purpose. And that's why the DCFTA already introduced, had uh, several aspects of regulatory approximation. Um, you refer to SPS, Sanitary and Phytosanitary Standards, which is the, the Annex 5 to the Association Agreement. And this is linked to, to the SPS chapter under the trade title. But there were also other areas um, of uh, increase enhanced economic cooperation in the Title V. Uh, and there we have agriculture, transport, energy, and, and other areas. So in this sense, the Ukraine is not departing from zero. We have uh, now, we started the negotiations 
with Ukraine in the context of the accession process, which is a political process that uh, will have as outcome, um, hopefully soon, the full accession of Ukraine as a member state to the European Union. But before that, we're operating on WTO terms and the association agreement complements the WTO treatment. It's a regional integration. And in this regard, we are working towards increasing the, so to say, um, integration between both sides. Uh, the EU is a very complex ecosystem, highly regulated. Uh, we have regulations ranging basically in all the internal market areas, and agriculture is no exception. And uh, this regulation, this regulatory environment is not static, it's dynamic, it's evolving continuously. So the, uh, the task for Ukraine is quite challenging. Uh, but what do we have now? So we have the DCFTA, which has uh, liberalized almost all trade. Uh, the part that was not liberalized was subject to tariff right quotas, to quotas under the DCFTA, and the European Union decided in 2022 to lift the outstanding uh, quotas under the DCFTA uh, by an autonomous unilateral uh, mechanism that is called the autonomous trade measures. This requires a regulation of the Council and the Parliament. Uh, we didn't do it through the association agreement. Um, the, this was a reaction of the European Union in the context of the war. The Black Sea was closed. We needed to support Ukraine immediately, quickly, in all areas. We did it with financial assistance, but we also did it in the trade domain. Um, we extended the ATMs twice in 2023, and we just did it now. You saw what happened in the member states, um, particular stakeholders, notably the farmers, and that led to some heated uh, debates and uh, discussions also in the EU about how to do this. So we were departing from the point of uh, high resistance, uh, and that's why we ended up introducing these automatic safeguards in the latest extension of ATMs in 2024 for seven products, the most sensitive ones. Five of them have already been activated, uh, but this is something that we discuss uh, in detail with the Ukrainian authorities, and also the Ukrainian authorities did their bit. Uh, they introduced licensing systems um, for, for instance, poultry and sugar, and, and this was a sign of good faith uh, from the Ukrainian side, which showed through these measures that they understood the sensitivities that we have in the in the EU member states. Now, if you look at the latest renewal of uh, ATMs in June, there is a statement of the Commission attached to it saying that we are going to pursue a path of uh, negotiation on trade relations under the association agreement. This is the Article 29. Um, so we are engaging now with Ukraine in this in this area. And uh, of course, is uh, we have in mind the need to support Ukraine when it comes to in the context of the war. Uh, Ukraine needs to continue to have open markets. Trade has massively increased between the EU and Ukraine. Up to 2021, uh, it doubled since the entry into force of the DCFTA, but it has continued increasing, not only because of the closure of the Black Sea. Now the Ukraine corridor is working well, but uh, we still have challenges in that direction. Um, so we see the integration of Ukraine into the EU uh, in all sectors as a, as a priority. This is, by the way, something that is mentioned in the letter, uh, the mission letter that was sent by President von der Leyen to the Commissioner designate for enlargement. There is a clear paragraph saying that you will have to work on the uh, gradual integration of Ukraine into the EU and that uh, using the maximum potential of uh, the association agreement and the DCFTA. Now, in the DCFTA, we have options to increase integration. I'm not going to go into other sectors, the agriculture, but we have machinery. Uh, on the SPS area, we can link to agriculture, uh, introduce equivalence of controls, for instance. But we, all, we have this Article 29, so we cannot project the outcome of these negotiations. It's a classic trade negotiation. But of course, we will have to take into account the context of Ukraine as a candidate country that will soon, will soon be, um, with, with whom we'll, we'll soon have bilateral discussions in the context of the relevant chapters in the uh, accession package. Uh, on agriculture, on fisheries, on SPS veterinary controls, etc. So the regulatory approximation is something that we cannot dissociate completely from this process, but we cannot promise now that we are going to have a quick and easy and smooth access of Ukraine to the internal market. The outcome of the DCFTA was uh, that we have to we needed to have some quotas in place 
uh, this was negotiated due to the sensitive nature of, of those goods. Um, and uh, in this negotiation, this aspect will have to be also considered. You also mentioned the reforms in the EU. So there is this pre-enlargement policy reviews that are taking place, and agriculture is no exception. We have a system in the EU that is highly um, you know, sensitive for farmers, and there will have to be a, a review of the uh, whole agricultural inter internal market in agriculture, and uh, the access of a country like Ukraine that is massive uh, will of course have consequences. So the EU is getting ready uh, to welcome Ukraine as a member state, and this means also doing our own internal homework. Um, we will uh, continue the direction we have set is uh, gradual integration of Ukraine uh, into the EU, and this will have to be reflected, um, set the spirit and the tone for the negotiations that we'll have. Uh, and uh, once uh, we have a successful process of gradual integration ahead of accession, this will this will greatly facilitate uh, eventually when Ukraine is um, about to join the European Union. Uh, at, until then, we'll continue supporting Ukraine with technical assistance under the facility, not only in, for the authorities, we have this technical assistance to the government, to the Ministry of Agriculture, but also to businesses. Uh, it's, it's difficult to, to adapt to new standards, to new ways of producing. You mentioned many of those already, Olga, in your presentation. and. Uh, there is a lot going on already from the technical assistance ang angle, but we also need investments. Um, so Ukraine will uh, benefit, especially smaller uh, farmers will benefit from uh, financial assistance to modernize and uh, become more compliant with the EU acquis in certain areas. And in the medium term, uh, this will increase Ukraine's uh, prospects to be further integrated into the, the EU internal market. And of course, we need to keep an eye on the Black Sea uh, it doesn't mean that Ukraine has to export all of its agricultural production to the EU. That will lead to massive disruptions in the within the EU internal market. Ukraine is exporting a lot to other countries. Uh, I think this is one of the priorities of the new Minister of uh, Agriculture. Uh, and the success of the Black Sea is crucial. We see that uh, there, are, there were attacks uh, in that uh, in that avenue. And we see that with, with concern, but we, we, stand, we stand clear that uh, the Black Sea is the main avenue for exporting uh, goods. Many member, many member states actually import a lot of, uh, of agricultural goods and grain from Ukraine, including my home country. Uh, we use it for jamon, uh, so we need Ukrainian corn uh, for us, but also uh, other countries, of course. And this is something on which we engage in dialogue with Mr. Taras Kashka uh, regularly in the context of our regular exchanges and also in the context of the annual trade committee. Um, and we also keep this Solidarity Lens initiative in place uh, to facilitate and make smoother trade by land and by the Danube uh, between Ukraine and the EU. This was a lifeline in 2022 when it was launched um, in May 2022. Unfortunately, we needed that avenue because the Black Sea was closed uh, for a while. Um, but we will continue investing on that because we see also in the longer term the prospects for facilitating logistics and transport uh, to the um, to the EU. And finally, the last point is on the overall agricultural sector. Ukraine exports a lot of commodities, not processed goods to the EU and to the world. Uh, now through the Ukraine plan and the facility, the Pillar 2 has investments uh, foreseen to develop food processing. Uh, and this is an area in which Ukraine can, can develop and diversify the export mix uh, that is highly dominated by commodities. This uh, leaves Ukraine at the mercy of uh, global prices and shocks. So a more complex economy, as happened with member states that joined, for instance, in 2004, will safeguard Ukraine from shocks and it will make the, the economy more resilient while also adding, adding value to the production and eventually incorporating Ukraine more effectively into the EU supply chains. Um, and that's not only applying to agriculture, it applies to other sectors. So we are uh, aiming this. This is the direction we take. The new commission has a clear purpose to support Ukraine in this direction. And the mantra in the coming years is gradual integration um, using the DCFTA and other possibilities that we have at our disposal. So I I hope I pass the message clearly that uh, yes. it's a sensitive topic, uh, but that's where we're working on. Yeah, Thank you. You. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh...
Apologies. Okay. I just wanted to thank you so much. I wanted to pass the floor to Mr. Taras Kachka, who is the Deputy Minister of Ukraine and the Trade Representative of Ukraine. Mr. Taras, please could you share your thoughts about the presentation and what was also mentioned by Mr. Fernandez Diaz? Also, if you have the possibility, I have a question for you. We do know that in the next period, starting from June 24 to June 25, we still have the free trade with EU, but already have certain limitations to seven groups of products, and namely what uh, Fernandez Diaz mentioned, that the further liberalization will be done as part of the agreement on association, which we had to revisit back in 2021. So in case you can say something on how the trade relations will be developed by Ukraine and the European Union in the next year, starting from June 2025, we would appreciate that. Many thanks. Passing the floor to you. Thank you. Uh, welcome from the road to Warsaw. So tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, we have a number of events in Brussels uh, related to how to set up the markets of interaction between Ukraine and the European Union, the agrarian markets, in such a way as to avoid problematic issues that have uh, appeared in our trade because of some really uh, abrupt changes in the product turnover. And uh, that pertains to the future mode of uh, trade between Ukraine and uh, uh, European Union after the June 2021. So that's where we have to come back to the point where we have we have models of integration with the European Union. We can share into the functional and the real political the functional analysis and uh, from the positions of real politic. So functionally, I believe the presentation which Olga has done it's very clear and we don't have uh, very specific questions we understand that our policy is moving it is moving to the European Union and we have here We have some subconscious understanding in the Ukrainian that is, uh, agriculture, but it's not uh, rationally understood why is that, but it's also some savings and maybe the roadmap for our agriculture. So evidently for us, uh, moving to the rules of the European Union are always painful because that means stepping over sometimes very voluntarily because the change that took place some 10 years ago from 14 to 15 or 13 18 if we take those five years so this change this was a success in the markets of the European Union because of revisiting what we are in the agricultural sector, especially when we have a lot of uh, producers of poultry, milk, animal uh, cattle stock, how to move to the European rules in terms of safety. It's not uh, just like that. It's the change of the business paradigm to be able to export into other regions uh, um, except for the CIS to be free from the uh, uh, wishes of the Russian Federation. So it's not uh, just like an additional load for Ukraine. The point is, it's just to understand how shall it be at the level of the business, how it will affect uh, the microeconomic rather than macroeconomics. But with this, another question arises also functional that in ukraine very often is since recently 
have come under the influence of the idea which is already dying. This was happening to the domain where I'm working. It's the international trade where we actually certain things were done entering the World Trade Organization, trusting that would happen something, but it didn't happen in terms of this Tokyo round of negotiations when the developed countries said that they will decrease their access uh, to the to their markets and they didn't so we had to work through FTEs. now with the European Union there could be the same story because we are now entering in negotiations with the European Union on accession where we don't have the right to say no so it's basically it's accepting 100% of the rules the way they are but in the European Union there are already big debates to which extent it was uh, justified the last generation of requirements towards agriculture and not only agriculture. So the question is to which extent the requirements within this uh, objectives of agricultural policy to which extent they were justified to which extent the requirements of the legislation in terms of pesticides which are being actually not accepted by the majority of the EU members that they should not be revisited so the EU now has this discussion and the question here is quite uh, peculiar because from the one hand we can't make the emphasis that we should have very special conditions taking into account the future development uh, and the requirements that may look like the, as if we were asking some simplified approach to accession. On the other hand, to speed up uh, it as soon as possible and implement the rules that will be evidently reconsidered by the European Union, this again will be a huge load for the Ukrainian producers. But also we have this real political integration to the European markets, and that's where they will recollect us the story of Spain that didn't have the access uh, to the European market uh, being in the EU for 10 years. They will recollect us, they will remind us, our neighbors, those conditions that they entered in that agricultural policy that was there for 20 years when it was very much regulated when milk production, sugar production was regulated, this was quite a communistic distribution. So they're coming back to us with the idea that first Ukraine needs to go through this process of opening markets of the European Union. And for us, this is not an acceptable position because we believe that we have been integrated for quite a long time and we really have done a lot on this way to which extent we will be able to do the change of this perception and really to prove that we are truly the part of the european agricultural system yeah agricultural in general because uh, we are also trading with switzerland norway and the balkans eu-centered um, agricultural and food system that we are the component which is integral and we need to build up huge together this is an open question and to the if how successful we can be of course it will also depend what will be the system of trade after june 25 so what is expecting us in the closest month is from the one hand a very detailed discussion on some um, sensitive markets such as meat, corn, wheat, but on the other hand, uh, this will be this uh, discussion about this very basic uh, something that is even hidden to the extent what is the attitude towards Ukraine so I can tell that our position for a start is not that good yes we are active we are strong in the agricultural environment but at the same time it's important for us it's important to fight 
that uh, the European market is our traditional. It's not only the Southeast Asia, but exactly the European market is quite traditional for us. And that's where we have a lot of discussion. And I would uh, just uh, make an emphasis that apart from functional things, we need to make a lot of emphasis what will be the future with the Ukrainian agricultural sector as part of the future. This is not the, only the question of subsidies, it's the question of seeing the budgets uh, to the extent that the balance will be done with the effectiveness and uh, the, uh, the uh, because uh, the agrarian policy in the EU is not only economics it's also the social policy but in sense of the structure of the society therefore in order to summarize I would not now, I would not really put uh, some strategic things. We really need, uh, in some practical terms, it's, uh, it's very simple. Because this policy is based on the EU rules in trade. We already have quite a detailed dialogue with pluses and minuses. But in any case, it's going forward, and the number of such sensitive markets, it is decreasing in trade with the European Union. Thank you. Many, many thanks. I want to pass the floor now to the representative of the Ukrainian agrarians, to Dmitro Kohan, the deputy head of the Ukrainian Agri Council. Mr. Dmitro, please could you share your impressions and if you could also reply to the question what exactly is missing for the ukrainian agribusiness to be implementing these norms uh, to a great extent maybe it's legislation maybe it's technical assistance good afternoon colleagues many thanks for the invitation summarizing the presentation of miss olga a lot has been done but still more is uh, ahead that's the kind of impression that we have. I can tell you, on behalf of our work council, it uh, covers a significant part of the Ukrainian producers, agricultural producers. Our main uh, major is exactly the production of uh, production, weeds, oil seeds, technical cultures. There is a separate peculiarity in milk, dairy producers, uh, uh, big producers are separate, also the food products uh, producers. Our topic is grains. So, uh, we, you had a slide in your presentation in terms of the geography of experts. I was quite surprised to see the figure of 60% of experts into the European Union. Possibly it pertains to some food products and in general of everything Ukrainian. But if we look at the grains, at least in the volume of the biggest experts, then Europe, maybe in 2023, Europe did account for some significant uh, values, because let me remind you that we had closed ports in the summer. Remember when the grain initiative was over, there was the downtime for four or five months, and a lot went via the Danube to Romania. So we can see that Romania is like three, what is this, three million or three billion dollars? That's billion, yeah, almost billion. It, it is billion. The same way we should not look at Poland or Romania as net import. Of course, this is grain that went to Constanza and then onwards. So based on our expert opinion, some 30% this could be the market of Europe and we have the prospects to grow this part, but once again, we are 
uh, facing that the European market is self-sufficient, especially <coughs> with the wheat, their net exporter, and this is one of our major export cultures. So 30% Europe, 70% is the rest of the world. Integration to the European Union, for us as the agrarian country, has uh, a lot of uh, uh, benefits that's access to the market access to the financial markets but uh, just for you to understand me correctly i'm not being skeptical i'm just concerned regarding the european union because it's also a significant uh, quite uh, significant uh, regulation in many markets, I mean, take pesticides, we did some preliminary research and we see that uh, we will not be able to be there successfully because uh, we have a huge number of products that are used in Ukraine. Of course, this will be the substitutes, but this will eventually uh, affect our costs of our production and our effectiveness. And that pertains to pesticides, this could be in animal production, in terms of uh, placement uh, of uh, so this will be quite a difficult process it has already started but still a lot needs to be implemented therefore we are seeing this uh, negotiations position so we need to first of all make some analysis because really a lot of good presentations have been with due respect i have seen a lot of interesting figures for myself but nobody and i think this will needs to be done nobody wrote out on paper what would be the most difficult things that would need to be implemented in ukraine and at least as important how much this will cost us because we are talking about our some meat, uh, participation in the agrarian policy in the development of uh, uh, dotations what we should do and how we should do it we have to understand the cost of this compliance to the european regulation and that's where we will be able to walk out and say something we are moving into the same direction we are all europeans we are taking one the same rules they have uh, certain complications but we are accepting this we're moving forward so please also take us into the distribution of dotations also in terms of the markets as Taras has mentioned, this real politic. This will be quite a complicated job for us as for Ukraine, because uh, Poland and Romania, all our neighboring countries, let's say honestly, we are competing with them also in the same markets and in case uh, somebody would come to us that another uh, some maybe big uh, country that should be a part of ukraine we would also be concerned when they want to enter so i absolutely understand these concerns of our european partners and neighbors of ukraine but once again, by dialogue, we need to find common ways where we can really help each other. I don't think uh, that everybody has this final picture in their head, but we need to start, and uh, along the way we will find the result. Many thanks once again for inviting, and I believe that the presentation is already uh, available on the internet, we can download Many thanks, Dmitro. I will just like to say a very short remark. In some of the items, the things that you have been talking about, many thanks for the engagement, many thanks for your position. Some of the items that you mentioned, that some of these items that you mentioned in terms of financing, that's once again a separate uh, this must be a separate uh, piece of work but regarding the rest really our colleague alberto unfortunately has left from the european um, union representation in kiev and Taraskachka. it uh, is really very much cross-cutting throughout all discussions european union themselves are in the process of reforming 
or the common agrarian policy is being reformed. You mentioned right now about the direct subsidies. What will we be getting? For what? So in case you read uh, this analytical note, and even in the strategic dialogue, it is mentioned that there is a proposal. It is not yet uh, brought up. It's not yet sustainable. It's not yet uh, uh, the proposal is uh, to refuse from direct uh, payments per hectare. And that, honestly, I can see this as a very realistic scenario that this process of such reform in the European Union, that they may be refused in the form that we know now, payment per hectare. They will not be there once Ukraine is entering the European Union. Of course, there can be some payments, but they can be tied to sustainability of production and some other things. So these aspects we also need to take into account, on the one hand, that complicates our work, because once again, Taras Kachka also mentioned about that, to integrate into that structure that is itself in this condition of certain changes, and these changes are likely and I believe that in the next 10 years they will take place further. On the one hand, that complicates. On the other hand, it uh, simplifies, because when such changes are taking place, you can still have it uh, maybe a little bit simpler to jump in and to propose the vision of the Ukrainian producers. Uh -huh. Look what Mr. Kashka has shown, how we see the future together. When we are strengthening you, we can be helpful to you, you can be helpful to us, and maybe where we can find some common things. So that's what we are talking about, about some of our common things. Yeah, my apologies. Just a second, I just wanted to recollect that, in my opinion, uh, the potential uh, share of Ukraine's participation from these uh, direct payments, I think it will be much more modest figures we need to communicate about that. Even if it comes to this, I don't think this amount will be so fantastic as it is uh, reflected in many reports. Uh, they're not realistic. So in any case, Ukraine will not be getting so much money as Germany or France or other key members of the European Union in the first years. So many thanks. I wanted to pass the floor to Vladimir Pugachev. Mr. Vladimir is the executive director of Donaya Soya. Also the same request to you, please share your impressions and possibly you could also let us know how it is happening at the market of technical cultures, what is the peculiarity and what needs to be done in the first place. Many thanks, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Many thanks, Ms. Yerna, for the invitation. Many thanks to Ms. Olga for very well-grounded research. I can only agree to a lot of issues that were mentioned. A little bit about myself, I'm Volodymyr Pogachev, I represent the Donaya Soya Association. Soybeans is one of the important uh, technical cultures uh, and European integration cultures. Uh, the European Union is net importer of these products, 87% based on our calculation of their overall consumption, the European Union is being imported. From the other hand, Ukraine is the number one producer of this culture in Europe, so that's where the problem problem is solved in its very natural way, and to a great extent, this is one of our, what I call the European integration culture. On the other hand, I'm also the deputy head of the uh, Agricultural Industrial Chamber of Ukraine, so I can share what problems we see and where we are in terms of the European integration chambers. And what was said uh, in Ms. Olga's research, most importantly, that's the institutional moment aspect, because there has to be people who have to understand what we should implement, read this, translate it, and put into the national legislation. And already at this stage, we have problems. Why? If we take the association agreement, if we take the Ukraine facility plan, that's where we have the directive that already lost effect, or the ones that have to be 
coming in effect in the few transitional years, and Ukraine has to implement something retrospectively or something that still the European countries don't understand how it will be working for them. And this is the problem, because in general, the European legislation is built up differently versus the Ukrainian legislation. And that's where we have to understand what we're taking, what were the changes taken. Also, to very, each directive, there is the so-called the implementation of directive where the European Union explains in more detail what needs to be changed, which aspects to take care of. And very often talking to the Ministry of Agriculture Policy and partially some directives are not even included into the so-called list of uh, works in terms of the uh, translation, which is official. Also, it's about knowing the languages because uh, this is the problem. Not always the experts. They are very much uh, oriented towards the internal the second aspect, it's uh, operation of the available data in terms of the agriculture of Ukraine. I'll explain you why. In Ukraine, under various uh, estimates, there are 4 million farmers or smallholders which is not mentioned in any agrarian registers. Last year, uh, the law was taken, was adopted in terms of the state agrarian register in order to start showing this uh, to the state agrarian policy. In addition to that, on the 4th of September, the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine implemented the agreement on joining IFAD, international organization, for the development international fund for the development of agriculture where the main objective of this fund is the support of the so-called smallholders so based on various uh, estimates and how if at is also using this ukraine has some four million of such smallholders this will also pertain to the issue of dotations, subsidies, because uh, a lot of uh, big companies of Ukraine vertically integrated. Uh, they can do themselves, but whether the smallholders can survive, I don't have the reply because we don't have the objective data that we can evaluate. We have some partially fragmented reports without the overall vision. Once again, it's a significant part both for the economy of Ukraine, that's a significant contribution to the agriculture, because a huge number of fruits, vegetables, dairy products, they are produced by the smallholders, grains, technical, oil seeds, uh, cakes, they are produced by big companies and exporters, but the internal market most likely lives on a huge uh, share from the work of the smallholders. So what can help we have a very interesting moment uh, of implementation, farm accountability, data network of the European Union, when once again all these questions of these institutional problems are there, but possibly this can help together with the state agrarian register to have some objective data in terms of what is happening. The next challenge that we're facing, I would characterize it as standards, but definitely that's a huge branch of power of legislation, how we should produce it, which pesticides to use, and the like. We also have problems because Olga has mentioned about genetically modified uh, organisms. So we really have adopted a very good European integration law. Uh, Ukraine, the Verkhovna Rada, with the participation of various stakeholders in August 2023, which has a three-year transitional period, and it also stipulates that a lot of bylaws have to be adopted. If we look at the European Union, there is no question of the classic GMO or not GMO. It is regulated. 
And that's it. So the questions are about some newest uh, GMOs. In the Ukrainian legislation, this is not mentioned because this is not yet there in the facility plans or in some other European integration plans. Because when we translated the terminology and had some discussions, uh, but once again, this is on top of our previous limiting factors, institutions, agriculture and standards to understand what we will be implementing, what we will be implementing, how we will be implementing and how to live with it, how to use certain possibilities of ex exceptions from the European Union legislation so that there would be extra possibilities for development for the Ukrainian producers. And the last factor is considering opportunities for common organization of the market, European food system between the European Union and Ukraine. Yes, because uh, there was uh, this uh, agreement on strategic dialogue where we are talking about some nuances about possibility because we need to make certain adaptations to some climatic changes and the climatic challenges are there. And possibilities how to strengthen the effectiveness of the overall system, not to delay everybody. That's all from my side. Thank you very much. Volodymyr has uh, confirmed those uh, conclusions that we have received. Yes, and because of the lack of time, you are not able to present many things, but just a short reflection. It's what Metro has said uh, in order to understand what we are doing to spend money on and in which way this will be organized, we have to understand with what we are actually working, because you recollected about this 4 million of smallholders, micro-producers. I'm sure we can have another two hours of discussion if we engaged the association of uh, farmers who are the landowners of Ukraine. Are they the full participants of the agricultural market of Ukraine? Partially yes, partially definitely no. So the question of agrarian statistics, I uh, tried to unlock it more in our analytical note, but this is one of the questions that we're not paying enough attention, because in my opinion, the statistics is a little bit uh, uh, neglected, because we don't have this proper vertical element that we need to collect the statistics. Of course, it's the war, but out, without the statistics, the, the, uh, uh, without this uh, good uh, base, it's very difficult to make really well thought through decisions and to generally understand what is happening in our rural territories, what is happening in every community, something that we can more or less effectively work. Many thanks to you once again. Yes, you have shed more light on this very important subject. Many thanks for the participation to everybody. Many thanks, Ms. Olga, for presentation and panelists for participation. Olga, just two minutes in case there is any general message. And I would like to remind you that the recording and the presentation are available on our website. Olga, please be finalizing and we will be finishing. We can't hear you. Apologies. Yes, it's very interesting to read the comments and questions. So many thanks for this. Many thanks for being active. Many thanks for joining us. You briefly, I'm understanding once again when I was working on the presentation and on the note to the extent that this project of European integration is multifaceted and it's important to to uh, 
lose this uh, all this and the other aspects uh, that uh, require this additional work it's something that Mitrov has said and Volodymyr Pogachev that pertains to the production and what concerns the rules of regulating the production or the rules of work for the internal market it's a separate subject and it's also very big and also it includes as was correctly mentioned a lot of uh, a lot of levels and these regulations and this uh, re legislative acts from the strategy to the implementation of directives and that all needs to be taken into account so i believe that our today's discussion is not it once again it's uh, summarizing our work in the framework of this project but it's also like three dots to be continued for some future work because even judging by the questions in the chat we also heard these questions related to agricultural insurance that's part of the financial system of how it's working the development of rural areas i believe this is one of the key questions where we need to the climatically adapted uh, agricultural production these are the questions that we need to change our focus to in order to move uh, more effectively in the European integration process and the like. So I believe that honestly, I have even more questions uh, raised and some ideas which I noted down compared to the answers which I tried, compared to the answers uh, that I tried to, to give as part of my an analytical note of my work on the presentation. So many thanks to all of you. Thank you for this inputs. And that's really those ideas and impulses that we can use. I'm very much sure also in the center of economic strategies in order to work on those uh, various uh, analytical assignments that then will be providing a lot of European integrational decisions. That's very clear. Many thanks to everybody for participation. See you next time.